And here they come. We have people joining us now, coming in fast and furious. Just over 50 people here already. I said it in the last workshop. I'm like, wow, wouldn't it be great if we actually had auditoriums where we could get people exactly. in, you know, instantly <laughs> into the auditorium <laughs> up to 140. So all of their meetings right now are virtual, even. Yeah, virtual. yeah, exactly. Well, welcome everyone joining us. If you've been in the last two workshops with us, um, you've had a fabulous morning. Hope you had a great lunch. Oh, excellent, and Heidi's here with us. Um, but post in the chat just so we know where you're from. Say your hellos. Um, let's see who's here. And we're gonna wait just a, a minute or so to make sure everybody- Hi. Well, hello, Heidi, how are hey, you? Hi, Heidi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Sure can. Oh, can I, I have to put my own volume on. <laughs> Technology. <laughs> Oh man, oh man. Okay, hi Julian. Hello, great to see you again. Good to see you again. How are you doing? Oh, very good, very good. It's a bit, it's a bit gray and rainy out there, but you all sound chipper and, and happy out there. It's gray and rainy here in Montreal. Oh, okay, so we're in the same boat. All right. Absolute, yeah. All right, so I'm going to do a very quick intro. Perfect. Oh, and we've got all participants are coming in Heidi they they, they have full privy to the back the background information so Rebecca, have you met Heidi before I think so one so long while ago back before COVID started <laughs> okay yeah I think we have met too so Becca works with me in uh, customer success and operations and yeah she really takes care of our online community and educates and does all these wonderful things to uh, let people know about Starling Minds and she puts together the collateral that you would have seen, um, you know, just talking about Starling Mines and, and how to use it and et cetera. So yeah, Perfect. a lot of education and engagement. Perfect. Yeah. Excellent. Got about 280 people here so far. They're still coming in here. Wow. All over. Others that are, a dreary rainy day as well so they're happy for for this being put together on their rainy day <laughs> perfect still climbing we're just shy of 300 people out there Welcome back, everyone. Heidi and, and those at QPAT, there is lots of love in the chat just saying thank you for today. So we'll reiterate that from our side as well. Like it's just been a real great, great day so far. All right, I think things are probably slowing down, Heidi. I think we can, we can go ahead and get rolling. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. I'm so glad to see you all here. And it's really a great privilege for me to introduce to you two people from Starling Minds. It's a, it's, um, a digital cognitive behavior therapy that we've been offering our members for about three years. And um, so I'm not going to talk very much because I, we all would like to be able to manage our stress, stress and anxiety during this really uh, unprecedented time. And we know uh, from uh, you know, speaking with teachers how stressful and overwhelmed, uh, it's overwhelming it has been in the classroom. Um, so I'm not, without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you uh, Julian Deck from Starling Minds and Rebecca Chen. So um, thanks for joining us and have a great session. Great, thank you so much. And I hope your conference is going well. Um, so yes, I'm Julian Deck, uh, Vice President of Customer Operations and Rebecca's with me. She oversees our community uh, management at Starling Mines. And really the goal of today's presentation is to talk to you about stress, worry and anxiety and just do, do some education around that. So we have some knowledge about it and how we can handle it. Um, but, and also just make sure we're putting things in context of COVID-19, which has definitely increased um, our levels, our normal levels of stress and anxiety. So we're gonna be talking about that. And um, the reason why we're, we do this as a, 
as a uh, interactive workshop is because we really want to create um, a sense that we're all in this together uh, during these challenging times and see how we can learn from each other. Um, at the end of our presentation, we'll go through some, um, some introductory basic cognitive behavioral therapy uh, strategies uh, or techniques um, that can really help you uh, manage your worry and anxiety. Um, yeah, because it's, it's all around us right now with COVID-19. Okay. <clears throat> so we just want to get to know you a little bit. A little bit. Um, as I said, we do some polls just to gather some information. All the polls, everything we ask is anonymous. Um, so please feel, to sh feel free to share uh, to your comfort level. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we just wanted to get to know you a bit and understand uh, the gender, the age, and also more importantly, just some of the stressors um, that you're currently feeling um, right now um, due to teaching, due to COVID-19, just due to life. Um, you know, what we're hearing right now from, you know, our other accounts across the country, uh, you know, some of the key words that really stuck with me is that teachers are already feeling like they're at November stress levels, which typically tends to be a high stress level because of parent meetings, uh, report cards, etc. And I was hearing this back in September. So, you know, the question is, how are we all going to be managing this um, when November actually comes? Um, and then 2021, what does that look like? So there's a lot of uh, uncertainty out there and stress levels and because you're trying to do the best job you can teaching because you care and your teachers um, and you also have this additional curveball and uncertainty of COVID-19. Um, I even heard somebody use the word that they feel like things are going to uh, implode <laughs> halfway through the year, which is a, which I was like, oh, that's a big word. And uh, they're like, yeah, no, that's how it feels. So yeah, we really just want to understand uh, how you're feeling so we can talk about it and, and try and normalize um, all this and just understand that we're, we're all in this together. And um, as a community, how can we help you? How can Starling Minds help you? How can your peers help you? Awesome, this is great. And we have 241 people have engaged in the poll, that 70%. We still have a couple coming in. We'll give maybe another couple of seconds and then we'll show um, the results of this poll. And again, it is anonymous, but, uh, and thank you guys so much. There's gonna be a few more questions throughout, uh, but this is fabulous. I think we're probably okay to go ahead and show the results. Okay. Let's do it. Okay, very good. So yeah, we, we, when we work with our, our uh, teacher, teacher education uh, accounts, we, we do see um, a, much, a large percentage being uh, female. So that makes sense. Uh, age group makes sense. And let's just see what we see, what people are saying. So looks like it's definitely the top one is, is work. And um, the, this, does, this does reflect uh, what we've been hearing just across the country. I would imagine balancing safety, your own personal safety, your students' safety, um, in addition to teaching. Um, you know, someone told me a funny story, like they still have to do fire drill. Well, it wasn't really funny. They still have to do fire drills um, because it's mandatory, and yet they were supposed to be doing fire drills with social distancing. I was like in my head thinking, good luck. That must have been a real challenge. So I can only imagine just all those little things um, adding up. Um, in addition to this background uncertainty of COVID-19 uh, must be very stressful. And of course, health uh, being the number two, right? Because we're, we're not through this, by no means are we through this yet. And um, you know, COVID-19 is this constant background level um, of news um, and uncertainty. So we'll talk about that some more. Um, family, of course, uh, how do we balance what we're doing for our work uh, which involves going out and being face-to-face -face, uh, in the classrooms um, and, and how does that impact our family and our family's health. So these are, this is all great feedback and um, I hope that by everybody seeing how everyone else is feeling, you get the sense that um, we're all in this together. No one's alone out there in terms of the challenges that they're facing and, and some of those rough days or rough mornings we may feel. You're not alone because um, this is an unprecedented situation that we're facing. Um, yeah, so just hearing from your peers, reach out to your peers, communicate with your peers, um, and 
you know, work collectively to understand uh, how we um, how we can support each other to do this. Um, yeah, Becca, did you want to share some thoughts totally. about seeing in the community? Awesome. Yes. So in the starting community, what we do see really does reflect what um, people are saying in the polls too. So while teachers have shared that since COVID, they've become worried about specific things such as increased workload, facing isolation, or about their family's vulnerability to the virus. But the majority of people say that it's not, it's often not just one thing that's stressing them out, it's many things at once. And so it just, on this next slide, we can see that on a regular basis, in a regular year, these are the things that teachers find stressful. This is what members share. But on top of all this work stress, you're also, you're also siblings, parents, children, and partners. So it makes sense that you also have personal stressors on top of all the work stressors as well. But this year with COVID, there are all just all of these additional health COVID related stressors too. And so, and so your plate has definitely been added to. Mm -hmm. On this next poll here, we, we're just wondering how much has your level of stress risen since September? And as we wait for everyone to pick their answers, in the chat box, we invite you to share specific reasons why your stress levels has gone up this school year. Mm -hmm. I know many people in the community have been talking about adjusting to remote learning if it's something they're doing for the first time. I know just setting up the Zoom webinar with all the techie bits to it, it was really challenging for me. So I can only imagine what you guys have been going through for the past couple of months. Yes, and remember all your answers are anonymous. Um, and really this is just to get a sense of community and, a, a sen and enable us to share uh, how we're all collectively uh, feeling. Okay, so we see very little in terms of the not at all, mostly uh, in the some quite a bit to a lot. Uh, 40, 60, yeah, so almost like 75% are the, in, the, in the some um, and higher. So this definitely is, is what we're seeing uh, as well with our other um, accounts and it makes sense, right? So we had a brief reprieve uh, for summer, but I don't know, it really felt brief this year. It did not feel like much of a, of a summer break. Um, so you had, hopefully you had a brief reprieve, a brief chance to charge your batteries, but really being back since September, obviously our, our stress levels, um, not just our normal stress levels, but our stress levels enhanced by COVID um, have all gone up. Um, so yeah, it really, it really makes sense from what we're seeing. And so the reason behind this, one thing that um, really clicked for me is, and something we're gonna get into in future slides, is a lot of times uh, worry and anxiety comes from uncertainty. And when we think about COVID-19, there's so much uncertainty around it. It's an it's a unprecedented, you know, one in every 150 year event that uh, no one's, been able to deal with yet. And so there's no, there's no certainty in terms of what next month is going to be look, look like, what three months from now is going to look like. And, you know, as teachers, you're trying to care for your students, you're trying to plan, organize, and everything's constantly shifting. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, hear, I'm hearing that teachers are, are, you know, choosing to or being pulled to uh, teach online or do both online and in classroom. As I said, uh, social distance fire drills, good luck with that. Um, there's so many different ways that uh, everybody's being pulled. And on top of this, there's the all the uncertainty that comes from COVID-19. So I think we all, I don't know, I feel better just thinking about the fact that the uncertainty from COVID-19 um, is, is something that we have to address and something that we have to deal with because the uncertainty is causing uh, stress and worry. And we're gonna talk about tools on how we can do our little bit, how we can do some simple things to manage um, that stress and uncertainty. Because um, we know otherwise it's difficult to make, it's difficult to make long-term plans due to COVID-19. Um, but if we give you some tools, hopefully you can create some, some plans that uh, can help you control um, and feel a little more 
give you a little more power <clears throat> to manage the stress and anxiety. Perfect. <clears throat> we just wanted to start off with one of the concepts that we go through in our program. How many of you have heard of the term mental health continuum? It's the idea that the healthiness of your mental health isn't static and, ch and can change throughout your life. Similar to physical health, where we can improve our physical state through exercising and eating well, we can also develop tools and strategies to make sure that we're able to manage our daily stressors. So at Starling, we often use this graph here to explain how our position can shift on the mental health continuum. And we've just plotted down a few things here that members share they found stressful during COVID. For example, the remote learning and using some of the um, education tools for first time. There's questions thrown at you right, left and center from multiple sources. Sometimes you have the answer, sometimes you don't. Many of you also have families and young children to care about as well. And you definitely have a life outside of your day job that's been affected by COVID. And so just adding all of this together, it makes sense as we can see from a previous poll that people are becoming more stressed out or anxious and getting lower on this mental health continuum. It's also important to know that um, moving up and down the mental health continuum tends to happen over a long period of time, such as months or years as we see during COVID. It, it doesn't usually happen just over days or weeks. While things like COVID and all the changes that have come with it can push us down the mental health continuum, there are ways that we can pull ourselves back up. And later on in the presentation, we will show you a few of our favorite techniques. We'll also be sending out a poster after this presentation that describes the mental health continuum. So hopefully you'll be able to print it out or share it with your family, friends, colleagues, and have it just there as a reminder for us to all check in with ourselves during this difficult time and see where we are at on the mental health continuum. Mm. So just this next section here, we want to dive a little bit deeper into anxiety and worry to help you find some ways to manage your specific triggers. Yes, good, thanks, Becca. <clears throat> so we wanted to focus on um, anxiety um, and worry because those are two um, key components to mental health um, and managing anxiety and worry are two key components to having a healthy, you know, to, to having healthy uh, mental health. Um, people often interchange anxiety and worry, but really we like to think of it as that it's two sides of the same coin. Um, they're similar, but they're still slightly different. So anxiety typically manifests itself in, in physical discomfort, um, headaches. It could impact sleep issue, your sleep, insomnia. Um, and at its, at its extreme, some people start to suffer from panic attacks. Um, worry is more like internal and it's typically a little more cerebral, cerebral where you're churning and churning and churning in your head. Um, and if we don't manage worry, it can distract us from the moment and it can prevent us from making uh, productive decisions. In fact, we can get into a worry cycle where we're just all we're doing is thinking about problems and it can become very unproductive. And over time, as Becca was mentioning, the impact of time, <clears throat> it starts to drain our energy over time and it starts to deplete us. And that's another really important part in mental health is we have to keep our energy up. When our energy starts to become depleted um, because of excess anxiety or excess worry, um, we start to degrade and our resiliency uh, to external factors such as a tough conversation with another teacher, um, stress and anxiety over wearing masks, not wearing masks, um, a meeting that didn't go well, um, our tolerance for those things become less. And um, that's really been something that's uh, been an eye opener for me is to understand that we have this baseline of worry with COVID. And then on top of it, we have all the things that happen during the day that can go well or not go well and not go well, it can be a trigger. So we have to be conscious of that and have tools to keep ourselves in the moderate zone. So as I said, anxiety you feel in the body, physiological changes, um, it is an ancient response. It's not necessarily bad. It's there, was there originally to keep you uh, alive and to make sure you're you know, feeding yourself and staying out of danger. And worry as well, like worry is the brain's way to solve problems. And typically it's characterized by starting with what if or should I or I should. Um, but 
in a healthy situation, that hopefully turns into solutions that help us. But in an unhealthy situation, it's endless cycle of worry. Uh, where we're not making any progress, it can start to impact sleep and cause ins an insomnia. Um, and that further drains our batteries. You can see these are vicious cycles. We're trying to stay in the virtuous positive cycle versus uh, negative cycles where, we're, where we are depleting our battery. But I just want you all to know that everybody faces and experiences anxiety and worry. Um, but if, if left unmanaged, it can result in what's called fight, flight, or freeze with the three Fs, fight, flight, or freeze. And I don't know if anybody's felt it, um, but it is a common experience if left unchecked. Even famous speakers, rock stars, I've heard that they can be quite nervous before a talk and getting up uh, on the stage, but they have tools to manage it so they can get into the flow and get into the zone, um, which is another thing we'll talk about later. So let's walk through this scale. So at the bottom end, number one, you know, just a little bit of a uh, excess heart rate, the heart rate's elevated, a little bit of light sweating. To be honest, I experienced that before this talk, it was a little bit like, wow, there's a lot of people coming. Okay, let's do a good job. It's totally normal, it's good, it kind of gets, gets the energy going and gets you engaged. So that's fine, that level of anxiety is okay and, and we can work with it. Um, but again, something I wanna emphasize, even though uh, giving a public talk on Zoom, maybe that puts us at a one or a two, we also have this background noise, this background uncertainty of COVID that's always with us. And maybe you read something in the news in the morning, or maybe you're worried about a family member, um, or maybe someone you know has gotten COVID, and that puts us right up already to a two or a three. So we're starting the day at a two or a three, and then you add on additional stressors as the day goes. So that's just something to be wary of in terms of where we're all at, um, at this mental health, on this mental health uh, and anxiety spectrum. So let's walk through some other, uh, as we go up on the scale to slide 10. Good. Yeah, so as it goes up, maybe there's changes in your breathing, uh, some lightheartedness, heart palpitations. Um, and in addition, again, in addition to the baseline COVID anxiety, I'm calling it baseline, um, there's stress about money, finances, and just the uncertainty that are byproducts of our work um, but also the byproducts of the COVID that's, that's being layered in. Um, I was reading some of the chat comments real quick, just a lot of frustration around safety protocols and you know what's being done to protect the teachers in terms of um, personal protection equipment, masks. Um, there's so many mixed messages. So I can only imagine um, how stressful that can be for you. Like, you know, going to the grocery store can be stressful, but I can only imagine being in a school full of kids and where there's a lot of missed messages and, and things aren't being followed properly, um, that must be very stressful. So um, we can definitely empathize with that. So again, we have to be all aware, aware of the baseline plus all these extra stresses that are being put on top of us um, that can take us out of this zone. So if we start going above five, so I'll move to the next slide. Um, if we start going up into the seven, nine, and 10, um, that's when we're starting to become unproductive with, the, with our anxiety and we might start to feel um, physical manifestations. We might feel it in our stomach. We might start to get uh, a stiff neck and a headache. Um, we might become agitated and you know, less pleasant to work with and maybe starting to have some negative thoughts. So everyone experiences it differently, um, but in general, we kind of use the word fight flight or freeze. Um, and so when we hit those higher levels, it's good to have tools to take us back to the moderate zone. And the first tool is just awareness. So just understanding, okay, of course I'm stressed out. I read the news this morning, it upset me um, about the COVID cases or something happening, um, you know, about how our school, how the, uh, you know, how we're handling health in, in school rooms. Of course, that's going to uh, bring us up to the moderate level already. So we need to be mindful of that and have tools, deep breathing exercises, whatever it may be, um, to try and bring us back from those, uh, the fight, flight, or freeze, um, or panic attack level. Um, moving on. So 
I just wanted to compliment all of you um, because you know one of the number one fears and uh, inducers of anxiety is public speaking. And uh, so as teachers, every day you're going up there and speaking in front of students. And so on top of everything else, you're also doing uh, one of the things that people fear the most and that creates anxiety for most people uh, in North America, at least. So congratulations on that. Thanks, Julian. So I believe we're running our third poll right now. And the question is, recently I've experienced the following physical symptoms due to anxiety. I'm just looking at some comments. Yes, the show must go on. That's right. Have to get up there and, and teach um, and balancing everything else. That must be difficult. Thank you. This is very validating. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, the kids becoming anxious as well. I mean, certainly uh, as parents, we uh, that's something uh, that I notice as well. And I'm sure you're seeing it with your kids. So thank you for um, thank you for everything you're doing to help them. Yeah. There's a lot of, a lot of mixed messages with uh, personal safety and health in terms of masks, um, shields, et cetera. Um, I'm sure that must be very stressful. All right. So Becca, you wanna talk about the poll results? For sure, I'm seeing the top results are muscle tension and headaches, sleep problems, concentration problems, stomach and digestive problems. So it definitely does look like COVID has increased anxiety and shown itself for many people in these symptoms. So thank you guys all so much for sharing your experiences. Yeah, this, this is how, this is typically how we will experience um, anxiety um, in our bodies. Um, one thing I'll mention, we notice um, when we can see uh, when the Starling Minds program is being used, a lot of the times <clears throat> it's being used between two and five in the morning. Um, so people are, are using it uh, to try and help them through the manifestation, manifestations of stress uh, and anxiety um, or worry that they're having um, during the night. Okay. So I wanted to introduce um, on the next slide, uh, something called operant conditioning, because I think it'll help us understand a little bit more about uh, worry and anxiety. So basically what it is, this is a concept in cognitive behavioral therapy um, where it's the, it's the, it's the triggers, um, triggers in life. So let's say a confrontation at work um, plus just our overall baseline uh, stress level together can create, can push us over into, into the, the right side of that spectrum that we're looking at before. And then that starts to create um, two different um, behaviors. So it either can create a behavior of avoidance um, or it can create a, a behavior of obsessing over something. And we'll get into the list uh, later on. But again, it's important to recognize what your baseline level is, where you are on the spectrum. Plus, if there's a trigger that happens, it can, it can move us over further to the right. So if we have tools that can help keep us more at the moderate to low end, um, we can avoid going into the um, obsess and avoid um, part of the behavior. But the thing is that as this, let's say there's a trigger that you know happens, I'm sure we can all list like the top three triggers um, that can get our blood going, uh, get us excited or get us upset. Um, if we don't learn how to manage those and we avoid it, well, that can cause anxiety in and of itself. So if we go to the next slide, um, you'll see that the more, the first time you're exposed to something that causes a trigger, um, you're in the red zone. But at the same time, if we don't learn how to manage that exposure, and I'm just gonna use an example of, let's say it's a difficult conversation um, or a confrontation at, at work. Um, if we don't learn how to manage it, either deep breathing to calm ourselves down or know how we wanna talk through um, that confrontation, and we just turn to avoiding it, every time we see that person or the situation arises, 
through the avoidance will also build back up to the red zone. So in cognitive behavioral therapy, we're not trying to say like, oh, don't deal with the hard stuff. We're building mental resiliency. We're building mental health by learning to how we deal with exposure. That exposure might be, like I said, something in the news. Plus, then you have uh, an argument with a coworker or an argument uh, at home. And so all those things combined can bring us into the red zone. So um, let's see. So, we're, so our natural tendency then is to avoid uh, these discomforts by avoiding the situations. But that doesn't work over the long term. And we don't build resiliency. And, um, and then the tension builds up just around over the avoidance. So there's this dynamic. Outright avoidance increases anxiety uh, as the event presents itself again and again. So yeah, think about a time like maybe you've had a difficult conversation with somebody. Um, you know, what we want to do is develop tools. And again, we'll, I don't mean to keep saying this, but at the end, we'll talk, just talk about some techniques you can have uh, just to help, to help um, you manage uh, exposure when it happens so you can stay in the zone and, and uh, work through these things. So, oh, I see, we're, uh, yes, we're jumping right to worry. Perfect, thank you, Julian. So now after talking about anxiety, let's dive a little bit deeper into worry. And so Julian did give a great, you gave a great definition earlier and I just want to summarize it here again. So worry is characterized by thoughts that often start with what if and I should. Often we find that 98% of the time when teachers are worried, you generally aren't worried about yourselves necessarily, but you're worried for all the people around you because you're not just caring people. Some worry is good because it results in problem solving, but when it just gets that high range, that's when it starts to result in effects like rumination and negative thought patterns. We do all engage in low, moderate, and high levels of worry. We have some examples here of what some low level worries might be. I, I might be worried about where I parked, whether I'll be late, whether I can find my keys, or whether there's leftovers. Um, for the past six months, I found that these types of worries were actually my pre-COVID worries. Now, my low-level worries when I leave the house in the morning result, revolve around whether or not I brought my hand sanitizer, did I remember to bring my mask, is it in my purse, how about all the other things that I need. And my level, one of my lower level worries is what if someone sneezes near me today or coughs. I know for you guys as teachers, it's probably more of a moderate or high level worry just because you're in such close proximity with other people during the day, whereas I'm just worried about the people in the grocery store next to me, at least six feet away. And so in this next slide, we have a couple examples of some moderate levels of worry that teachers have been sharing in our forum to do with COVID. We definitely saw these throughout the summer when things were really uncertain, when we weren't sure there was like a plan, when if we, we weren't sure what the safety measures were going to be. And these are some examples of the higher levels of worry. We, find, we do find that the background or baseline level of worry does seem to be higher now with COVID, and we tend to worry about different things, which totally makes sense. I mean, who doesn't get nervous when they hear about rising case numbers in their area or about people who've been affected with the, with the virus and maybe passed away, especially since it's someone that you might know. And so we're curious to see what are some examples of things that you were worried about pre-COVID that you would consider to be in the moderate to high level range versus now during COVID. What do you find worrisome now in the moderate to high level range? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so uh, similar to anxiety, worry is a very useful thing and can help us problem solve to help us achieve that level of certainty. But in times like COVID, it can be hard for people to stay on the more responsible problem solving side and really easy to move to the other side where it gets a little bit excessive and makes us feel really overwhelmed. I know for me, I definitely go down a rabbit hole and go from trying to problem solve my worry by looking at some news. And it's just so easy for me to become, to realize that I'm actually now ruminating excessively and becoming really stressed about the rising cases. Oops. So moving to our next poll here, we're just wondering over the past couple of weeks, were there times where you weren't able to stop or control your levels of worry? Hmm. 
I can see a lot of comments here about just not being able to, um, un, not able to know what to expect. So a lot of uncertainty. Um, yeah, thinking about basic things like masks, sanitizing hands, public transportation to get to work is can cause fear and uh, anxiety for sure. <clears throat> Good, I see some people are sharing their techniques, meditating, exercise. All right, good. So it looks like the results are up. Um, yeah, so definitely it looks like more than, just over more than half um, are, are, have not been able, so not that they're worrying more, it's just that have not been able to control or stop my worrying. Um, and the implications of that, as I mentioned earlier, is it can drain our batteries when we can't control it or turn it off at night. Ideally, we have productive worry that helps us come to solutions. And ideally, we can turn it off at night, go to bed and have a nice restful night's sleep, eight hours, wake up in the morning refreshed. That's probably not happening for a lot of us because of COVID-19 in addition to uh, the work that you're doing. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, this increased level, I mean, also the challenge is because as teachers, you're naturally um, problem solvers. You, you want to create, obviously, um, plans, teaching plans. You want to be able to um, plan everything out uh, for the semester. Um, and just with all the uncertainty around online, offline, all those changes, I'm sure that that can uh, create a lot of uh, extra worry for you. So, so much uncertainty. And that takes us to um, our next slide. One thing that uh, is really important to know, or at least that helped me understand, um, you know, where worry and anxiety comes from, is it just comes from uncertainty. And we all have to acknowledge the uncertainty that has been created by uh, COVID-19. And so as we move through this, towards the end of the presentation, we want to share with you um, techniques that can create that little bit of certainty, that little bit of planning in your life, that little bit of stability, so, um, so that you have a, a foundation and a bedrock uh, to work off of, uh, to help manage um, stress and anxiety and keep us from the right side of those spectrums that we were looking at earlier. Okay, so just moving on. Um, you know, there are some natural ways that people cope with anxiety and worry, and maybe um, you're familiar with some of these behaviors. Um, this goes back to that slide where I was showing um, either obsessive uh, behaviors or avoidance behaviors. Mm -hmm. So as our anxiety and worry levels escalate, um, some short-term ways that we tend to deal with it is uh, through controlling behaviors. So, you know, questioning of decisions, self-doubt, seeking reassurance from others. Um, overprotecting, uh, over planning. Um, I definitely, we, we, you know, I'm, I'm guilty of that myself. Um, also, but on the other side, some natural tendencies, maybe you've noticed that uh, you're procrastinating more or just having a harder time committing. Again, we have to have that, put that in context. The reason why these things may be happening is because of the background stress of COVID-19, um, plus the uncertainty that that's created in your work. So we call these um, uh, generalized anxiety disorder. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you. It's just that these are natural tendencies that tend to happen. Um, and people are more likely to engage in these behaviors as the levels of uncertainty um, increase. So moving to the next slide. Thank you. So engaging in these behaviors results in a temporary relief and a temporary feeling of control um, and decreases our level of anxiety temporarily. However, the, the negative side to this is that it chips away at our tolerance for uncertainty. Um, and we're, it's not taking a strategic uh, way to handle stress and anxiety. So these are control uh, tactics, but the more and more um, you work, the, the more and more you either you know, avoid a confrontation, um, procrastinate, um, or obsess and, and uh, over plan things, it's actually depleting your batteries. So we wanna try and break that habit um, or just be aware of it 
um, so that uh, we're not depleting our batteries over time, which again, when we have low energy levels that can push us to the right side um, of, of anxiety and worry. So again, just some of, it just starts with uncertainty and knowledge, uh, knowing you know, where you're at on that spectrum, doing things to take care of yourself, to recharge your battery, um, and then just knowing what your triggers are. If the news is getting you uh, upset in the morning, maybe don't check the news in the morning. Or maybe wait, well, don't do it before bed either. <laughs> <laughs> maybe sometime midday or just after school when you have time to digest it. Uh, with a healthy, with a with a non-tired mind. Um, but anyway, we'll keep going so we can get to our CBD techniques because it's 1042. So we're on the next poll here. Perfect. This is the last poll before we head into the strategy. So I think we're right on time. So this question asks: Recently, since September, have you real have you experienced an increase in the following control and or avoidance behaviors that we just went over? Julian, it's so funny that you mentioned that you should, we shouldn't be reading the news before bed if that makes us really stressed out because that was one of the behaviors that I saw myself engage in for the past six months. Yes. I never used to be on Reddit, but I found this subreddit for Vancouver and there was this one person who would, without fail every day for the first couple months of lockdown, they would post a graph they made and then update every day on the number of new cases that day, number of people who recovered and the number of new deaths that day. I found it so informative. I got really, I, I got really addicted to just seeing that every single day. I needed to know what the numbers were. Just having that knowledge and that information really helped me feel like I had some level of control over the situation. But on the flip side, I was every I was reading a read for bed, and it was help, it was not helping with the sleep situation at all. Yes. Were there any? Was there anything that you see yourself doing on this list, Julian? Or if anybody else has some thoughts of it they would like to share we'd love it to see in the chat as well yes share in the chat i have a funny little story i have a little patch of lawn in front of my uh, a duplex apartment that i live in and um or whatever it's just a patch of lawn i've never really cared about it but over during covid i started like obsessing over it and fertilizing it and plucking out the weeds and mowing it to look perfect and i want it to be full and green and my wife was like, what's the deal with this grass? Like, you've never really cared about it. And I was like, I don't know. I just want it to look good. And I realized after working at Starling, it was my little way to try and control something. Like, here's a little patch of grass, and I want it to look nice. And I want it to look nice when I walk by it. So it was my little way of uh, trying to just take something in my life and, <clears throat> and manage it. So not saying that was a bad thing or a good thing, but it was just a, re a reaction for sure to the uncertainty that was around us. And the grass does look better, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> the have come back, and it looks like the top one for people is constant checking of the email, phone, social media. So I'm so glad to hear that I am not alone in this behavior. <laughs> yes. Other top ones look like um, questioning decisions, yeah. Seeking reassurance and procrastination. Yeah. yeah. Good. So you're not alone. Um, so strategies. So this is the part where we um, introduce some strategies, and um, so we'll just get started with that because it's it's ten forty five, and we want to make sure we have time to go through this. So it's really important to recognize in cognitive behavioral therapy that we see that everything, our moods, our behaviors, our physiology and our thoughts are all interrelated. So if one is up or down, the others are all gonna be affected. So think about like coming in a bad mood because you're, you didn't sleep well and you read some news that triggered you or maybe something happened on your way to work that upset you. That's gonna affect your behavior and how you interact with others. That's gonna affect your thoughts in terms of you know, what you're thinking for the day, positive or negative. And it's also gonna impact us physiologically, maybe tight shoulders, maybe feeling a little more protective. <clears throat> so um, in cognitive behavioral therapy, we, we have some relax and recharge um, strategies. We have some goal setting strategies and we have thought balancing strategies. For today, we're gonna to focus on the goal setting um, and thought balancing. Um, the relax and recharge can be simple, simple things like exercising, going for a walk. Um, I heard one person say drinking a glass of wine. Okay, that's fine. If it's 
you know, a, a healthy glass of wine, that's good. Um, but let's focus on the goal setting um, and the thought balancing, because these are important tools in cognitive behavioral therapy and tools that we have uh, in our program. So the reason why we have these is because, you know, we've, we've talked about the background stress and anxiety of COVID-19, but in addition to that, we have these triggers that can happen. And we all have these triggers, whether it's reading the news, a conflict with a coworker, um, checking, getting that credit card bill ooh, in the mail, uh, checking our bank account. Um, these can cause our anxiety and worry levels to go up. So let's say we, we have a conflict with somebody um, and then the, we go up the curve um, towards the top of the curve. And if we don't have strategies in place, we can get to that point of no return. So we can get to the eight, nine or 10 on the two scales that we were talking about. Um, and then we're feeling it in our body. It's affecting our moods. It's affecting our ability to think and it's affecting our behavior. So the first thing is we want to be aware of what those triggers are. So after this presentation, I encourage you to write down what your top three triggers are. Be aware of what they are. You can either avoid them, but then remember avoidance doesn't create resiliency. And then you're, you're less resilient so that when the trigger does happen uh, and you can't control it, then you're less likely to be able to handle it. Um, or you can create strategies to manage these triggers. So one, we know, want to know what our triggers are, and then we want to find ways that we, we can relax ourselves to get up, keep us below the point of no return. And maybe that's deep breathing, positive affirmations, going for a walk, and we'll talk about um, some other ones as well. So yeah, so in this example, trigger happens. Let's say there's a conflict with the parent, it takes us up above the point of uh, no return. With uh, cognitive behavioral therapy strategies, um, goal setting, thought balancing, we can stay below the line. And that's really um, you know, the main, uh, the most important part of our program is learning how to manage and deal uh, with stress and anxiety versus avoiding stress and anxiety. So Becky, you wanna to go to the next slide? Yes, perfect, thank you, Julian. So another way to also think about the benefits of relaxing and recharging is here on a larger scale, maybe throughout the day. So during COVID, it can feel like our stress levels are higher all day. And when we track it, it might look something like this top teal line here. Of course, we'll feel different ups and downs throughout the day and yours might be an inverse of mine or yours might be, you might have more ups and more downs. It just really depends on what stresses you out throughout the day. And so if we were to take an example of a relaxation tool and for everyone it's different, it might be walking, it might be listening to music. I think someone's mentioned eating chocolate. Um, yeah, whatever it might be, if we do it a couple points throughout the day, it's possible to take ourselves down that stress level a few notches so that it looks something more like this bottom blue line here. And so this blue line is the difference between um, using strategies and not using strategies. And at Starling, an important thing we always try to remind ourselves is that really we shouldn't be so hot on ourselves, especially during such difficult times, and expect to bring our stress levels down to zero right away. It really just does take practice and time to figure out what our stressors are, what our triggers are, and what are the tools that really work and resonate with us to be able to bring us down those notches. And so just please remember that even just bring yourself down, their stress levels down just a few notches is definitely a win. Yeah, that's really good. So we're trying to make this uh, obtain attainable um, and simple. Um, and so one of the best ways to manage your stress and anxiety is to set goals um, either to manage that stress, to manage the specific triggers uh, to manage the specific stresses and anxieties that are elevating your stress and anxiety, or just to set goals that are going to help you relax and going to help bring your stress and anxiety levels down. Remember, worry and anxiety comes from uncertainty. So the good thing about setting goals and goals that are SMART goals, which are specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely, um, is that you're creating a level of, of certainty and control in your life. Um, and you're trying to create a level of certainty and control over how we handle those triggers. So they help create certainty by, and also by creating uh, routines in our life, by following through on our goals. 
it sounds so simple. The hardest part is actually doing it. And the hardest part is actually following through on it. And the hardest part is actually doing it in the moment uh, when these triggers happen. So make sure, especially when you're starting with your goals, don't overestimate where you are um, in terms of your mental health. And so don't make it too complicated or too big that it's not attainable. You, need, you want to have a win, something that's super simple so that you can win and feel the benefit of that goal and feel the positive reinforcement of that goal. There's a lot of micro skills that are required, but you can do it if you start simple and you start with something that's a short time frame um, and don't make it too big, too audacious of a goal. So again, it's important at this time because it helps set up habits, it helps set up routine. And those habits and routine are a level of certainty that your nervous system needs um, and that your, your mental health needs uh, to help keep us below the line. So last month, I have to admit, I was feeling some anxiety to the point where I was starting to feel it in my stomach, my shoulders, uh, my head. I just felt like my nerves were, were crackling. Um, and I think it was because, you know, we just, it was the realization we've been dealing with COVID for six months. We've all been working so hard. Um, so and I wasn't thinking clearly at work. I was feeling overwhelmed and I was really tired. Um, so I knew this wasn't sustainable. So this wasn't the first time this has happened to me. Um, so now I have awareness like, okay, I need to deal with this. So I'm going to set some goals. And I could feel that fight, flight, or freeze come in, and I wanted to run away to a snowy cabin in the woods and leave it all behind. But uh, you know, I don't think my family would appreciate that. So I need to have tools to, to help um, manage the anxiety that's there. So basically what I did is I just came up with um, three, four simple goals um, to help take care of myself and to help take care of my mental health so that I could stay in that healthy balanced zone, which we'll show you. So again, these, aren't, these don't have to be complicated. My goals were simply go for a walk outside two times a day, to get fresh air, even if it's just for 15 minutes. Because what I was doing is I was working at my desk all day. And since there's no commuting, I was starting at 7, 7.30, and I was going till 5, 5.30, 6, 7 sometimes, and then coming back at night. And that just was not healthy, and that was depleting. Um, the, the second one was to really get emphasize getting enough sleep. So get a minimum of seven hours of sleep per night. So my goal is to be in bed by 10 o'clock. So that means putting the phone away, recharging it in another room, turning it off and get sleep. Sleep is so important to our mental health. Um, and there's a great book called Why We Sleep um, that I highly recommend. It'll really, if it'll really convince you on the benefits of sleep. And the third thing was uh, sweat two times a week. So not five times, because that's not attainable. And then I would fail. Two times is I can fit in something in a weekend and I can fit in something else once during a weekday. I can do that. And by doing it, it was a positive reinforcement, plus obviously helps release stress. So you can see these aren't, these aren't hard goals, but it creates a sense of achievement. It creates a sense of certainty in our lives and it creates a routine amongst all this other craziness. We're being responsible and we're taking control. And then uh, the last one was using our Starling Minds app once per week, uh, just because there's so much great information in there. I wanna make sure that I'm constantly using and refreshing myself on all these techniques um, at least once a week. So all these things combined really helped and helped me course correct my stress and anxiety and I don't feel it anymore in my body, it all passed and I can be a more present uh, manager, I can be a more present father, and I can make smarter and uh, more proactive, productive um, decisions because my resiliency is higher. So I hope those examples all helped. Um, okay, so moving on to the next slide. Perfect. Thanks, Julian. Just in the interest of time, I think I'll skip over just to the next yes. or last strategy. I agree. Yeah, we've got about five minutes and we do have a few questions uh, out there as well. So sounds good. Yeah, I think we can end on the slide and just go straight into the Q&A after Julian. How's that sound? Yeah, sounds good. Cool. So our last strategy is my personal favorite. It's thought balancing. So for me, it's just so important to take a step back when things start escalating in my mind and just to manage my thoughts before I do get to that point of no return. And so for those of you who haven't heard of the strategy before, it's a method that helps us take a negative thought that's causing us harm 
to really get us to look for why we think it, so the facts that back it up, and then look for facts that kind of go against it. And then after that, we repackage the statement and make it more balanced. This is a strategy that has really helped me improve my confidence and decrease my stress and anxiety. So I hope it'll help some of you out there as well. So I'll just run through an example really quickly. And the thought I'm going to go with is I'm going to catch COVID-19. It's something that's definitely popped in and out of my mind over the past couple of um, months. And so these are the reasons why I think this. So I have my facts for. I'm situated in BC and cases are rising right now. I find myself having experiencing some mild symptoms and every week I have to go to the grocery store and touch things and see other people. So that feels a little bit dangerous. And also just the people inside my bubble, some of them still have to go into work and they're not all um, working from home. So they do have that risk of coming in contact with other people. And so personally, I find that um, I often don't automatically think of ways that my really harmful thought is actually untrue. And many members do express this in the community as well when they're trying thought balancing for the first few times that it's not natural to just try to prove yourself wrong. So I find this strategy really helpful in helping me um, think that other way. So these are some of the facts against. I'm looking back, taking a step back and telling myself that actually, I'm, actually, I'm washing my hands very frequently and I've used hand sanitizer more in the last six months than I ever have in my entire life. I'm definitely wearing masks everywhere I go and I keep some in my purse just in case I forget on a day. And the people in my bubble, although they go into work, it's not very frequent and they are very responsible and respectful of all the COVID guidelines in our province. And just lastly, my symptoms are very similar to that of allergies or something else that's definitely not COVID. It really doesn't help that all the things that um, they're listing for symptoms is something that can actually be indicative of a bunch of other <laughs> bunch of other things. And so after just looking at it from both sides, I come up with this balanced thought for myself. So I think although cases are rising, I am doing everything that I can to avoid infection, which greatly reduces my chances of getting COVID. I find that once I repeat this to myself a few times, it makes me feel a lot better and I'm focusing instead on all the things that I have control over that I am able to do to stay healthy and COVID free. I just find that having the tools to, to be able to reassure myself makes me feel super empowered. So this week, I would just challenge you all to identify one thought that's been stressing you out and think of ways that you can balance it. Good. Thanks, Becca. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, all of these are to keep us in the zone, just that level where we're, we're, we're productive and we're engaged. So we'll just ask one more question, but, and um, while those are being filled out, uh, we can, yeah, we can ask, um, we can ask here, listen to some of the questions and answer some of the questions. Sure, a lot of the questions um, I think was help provide strategies and you guys did such a great job at that. And also just recognizing, you know, people are going through health, other health issues themselves, children have the health issues. Yeah, it's a stressful time, but I think your strategies have been great. So thank you for that. Another question though, that I, I, I mean, you touched on strategies for us. How about for those students that are coming in? Um, Isabel has a, a grade three child that comes in crying every day, but I'm certain, yeah, how, how do we help our students? Same strategies or do you have other advice for that? Well, I mean, obviously it's gonna be, the, the, the root cause of that is gonna be very specific to that child and, and hard to know, but I think what I, my answer is do something that's attainable, realistic, uh, that you can achieve in a timely manner. Um, so, what can you do to help that student? And and set you know set a goal for yourself that every day I'm going to I, I don't know I'm going to connect with that student uh, one minute before class or one minute after class and just ask how they're doing. So, can you be a pillar of support just for that? Um, you know, maybe another goal is okay. I'm going to connect that student uh, with the counselor if that's available at, at your school. So it's really just about managing our stress and anxiety and these upsetting things by thinking about what's, what's something simple, attainable, achievable that I can do to try and control the situation. Um, if we make things too big and complicated, we don't do it, we spin our wheels, it's too hard, we get frustrated, we get depleted. So really 
you know, in so many parts of our life, just focus on what are those goals and those thought balancings that you can do um, that are going to make you productive and proactive. I don't know if that helps. I think so. And I think your messages have resonated huge. The chat um, is off the hook. So many people are just so appreciative, as am I, as a mother um, and as an educator. So thank you so much. Um, and the poll results, I don't know if we show the poll results, but enthusiastically, people would recommend your words to others. So that is great. Um, I'll turn it over to you, Heidi, to finish things off. Well, I want to thank Julian and Rebecca. It's been really, really good. And uh, just want to let the members know that Starling Minds is available for you. You just have to go to starlingminds.com and then you use your uh, Industrial Alliance number to get in. So it's really worth it. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm part of it and I've done some of their um, some of their programs sometimes it's only 10 minutes a day so it doesn't take up much time and uh, you really get a lot out of it so thank you so much for being here with us today and I hope you all have a great weekend thank you so much everybody thank you so much. have a great weekend bye bye thank you, thanks Michelle